Well, Merry Christmas again. If you're with us online, Merry Christmas to you as well. So happy to see each and every one of you here today. We are at the climax of our December message series, which is Christmas Road Trip. And uh, as we get ready for this evening, I, I've been thinking about various road trips and the way that we prepare. We love trail mix, so we'll make our uh, jaunt to Aldi or someplace like that to get the kind of trail mix that we like. And I know the, the type of uh, road trip appropriate beverages that we enjoy, uh, sugar-free Gatorade's one of them, we, uh, Diet Sprite, Mountain Dew, uh, if we need an extra pick-me-up, coffee, of course. Uh, one of the other things that I'm also very mindful of when I get ready to go on a road trip is I got to know where the bathrooms are along the way and how the different distance between pit stops may be, but also, too, to kind of time uh, the necessary pit stops to go to the restroom in order to be able to fill up the car. So, you know, as I empty, I'm refilling the car, getting ready for that. Uh, but also, of course, when you embark on a road trip, what's one of the most important things you got to know? Where you're going. Exactly right. You got to know where you're going. And that's been the whole point of how we get to where we are this evening in our celebration of Christmas with our series called Christmas Road Trip, The Journey of a Lifetime. Now, to let you know kind of really quickly how we got to this point, we've been looking at the key central figures of the nativity story throughout this month of December to help us get ready for tonight. When we started the series, we began by looking at Mary, Mother Mary. The angel came and told her that she was going to bear a son, and she was like, well, I don't know how, because I haven't done anything that might make that possible. You catch my drift, right? And so the angel told her that the Holy Spirit was going to come and bring about the child that would grow in her womb. And Mary offered one of the most absolutely beautiful and poignant statements in reply. She said, let it be with me according to your word. There's an incredible message in that. When we hear something that God wants to do in our lives, to hear that and know that we need to surrender in obedience like Mary and say, let it be with me according to your word. Then the next Sunday, we looked at Joseph and how in Joseph, he would have and live into the character that God would choose to raise essentially himself. You know that old adage about, you know, you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family? Well, God the Father chose Mary and Joseph to raise Jesus, the Son and the Savior. Imagine the responsibility with that. But just like Mary received surprising news that she was going to bear a child without having done anything to make that happen, Joseph also heard the same. Now, when Joseph found out that Mary was expecting a child, you had to know that that rocked his world. Absolutely, because he didn't have anything to do with a pregnancy. And Joseph was a righteous man, which means he wanted to follow the rules. He wanted to be obedient to God like Mary was being. And so what he decided to do, as the scripture tells us, that he just decided to dismiss Mary quietly, secretly. Now, why is that important? I'm glad you asked. It's important because of a couple reasons. Now, Mary and Joseph were already engaged, which means they were in that second absolutely critical point getting ready for their wedding. They were as good as married, even though they had not exchanged their vows. And so for Mary to come with child without having Joseph be the physical father, in his mind, Joseph was probably thinking that Mary committed adultery. And the penalty for adultery in the time that the scripture was written was, guess what? Death by execution, stoning, no less. So what Joseph did by quietly dismissing Mary, at least that was his posture to begin with, was he was taking the shame on himself as one who had fathered a child and was not going to see it through to its raising. And God saw in Joseph the type of integrity and character in a man who would raise the Savior of the world, who would take the shame and guilt of all people, you and me included, now, Joseph was convinced by an angel in a dream that the child Mary was carrying was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and he had a very distinct and specific purpose in his life to be Emmanuel, to name him Jesus, which means he will save them from their sin. Emmanuel meaning God with 
us. And to this point, we see, as we would sing in Old Little Town of Bethlehem, the intersection of the present time and eternity, when the hopes and fears of all the years are met in Christ that evening. It's a beautiful thing to think about. Scandalous, yes, but also quite beautiful and quite moving if we allow the Spirit to surge in our hearts to let us know about the love of God and how God comes even in the midst of our scandals, in the midst of our misses and messes and mistakes, and God comes to prepare us for eternity. And so the Christmas road trip, the journey of a lifetime, as it was with Mary and her trip to go see her cousin Elizabeth, as it was with Joseph as he goes to ancestral home, all involves a trip, so to speak, a movement to think about how God moves in our lives as well. The movement is important because sometimes that journey itself is just as important as the destination. And so God used that movement in their lives and in their work to speak into us about how we also need, like Mary, to be obedient and submissive to the movement of God in our lives. And we need to be like Joseph of character and strength and courage and integrity so that God can fulfill in and through us what he wants us and what he wants to do. And so that's when we gather for Christmas Eve, how we consider their road to Bethlehem from Nazareth, but also how we intersect it here in this time and in this space on this Christmas Eve of 2022. So let's turn our attention to the gospel lesson, which comes from Luke's gospel, the second chapter. We're only reading the first seven verses this evening. I'm using the New King James Version, which is my favorite for this passage, because it just, it, well, Linus Van Pelt quoted it, so it's good for me, right? And the Charlie Brown Christmas special. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, let's pick up with the gospel lesson for this evening. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. To be married, sorry, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid them in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. The word of God for God's people. Giving thanks to God. Let's say amen. Hallelujah. All right. Merry Christmas. Very good. All right. So we're going to be looking at the road this evening. Now, the first aspect of the road is the road from Nazareth to Bethlehem. It is widely believed that there were two routes that they could have taken from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Both were more or less 90 miles. Now, to help put that in some perspective, it would be like going from here to, say, Athens at the University of Georgia on foot or on the back of a donkey. Could you imagine that trip? Some 90 miles from Hope Church to the University of Georgia. Now, if that doesn't tickle your fancy, because I know that there are some who would probably say, Athens, I've never heard of such a place. What about Blue Ridge, Georgia, in the mountains? That's also roughly 90 miles between Hope Church and Blue Ridge Mountains. And maybe that doesn't quite speak to you. What about Chattanooga, Tennessee? To go see Rock City or to experience Ruby Falls or the Incline Railroad, the Chattanooga Choo Choo. Or some of those things like that. All of those are roughly 90 miles from where we sit here this evening. And Mary and Joseph made that trip. Joseph on foot and Mary on the back of a donkey, most likely. We don't exactly know, but the cultural depictions of their journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem give us the idea that Mary was probably riding on a donkey. Now, this trip, this trek, the trail that they took from Nazareth to Bethlehem was critically important for the unfolding of what it was that God was trying to accomplish in the world through the birth of his son and our Savior, Jesus. Now, I told you there were two tricks that they could have taken, two trails. The first trail was a little bit easier and a little bit shorter, but it went through Samaria. 
Now, if you know anything about the ancient biblical times, the Israelites and the Samaritans, they didn't get along. In fact, they hated each other. And since Joseph was a man of righteousness and integrity, he would have followed the traditional teaching that you stay away from Samaria. Most likely, they did not take the shorter or the easier trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem, which would put them on the second route, which would be a little more difficult, a little longer, and yet a little more treacherous. But here is the amazing thing about the geography that tells the story of God's redemption of humankind. Because while they were taking that way, it wasn't just any ordinary road. It wasn't a Charles Hardy Parkway or a 278. This was known as the way of the patriarchs. Because the way of the patriarchs told the story of God's interacting with humanity from essentially the beginning of their time. So the way of the patriarchs would retrace 1,600 years of biblical history. On this road, they would pass the place where God told Abraham that he would be the father of God's own nation and that he would have so many descendants that they would be like trying to number the sands on the seashore or the stars in the sky. This is the place where Jacob had visions of angels ascending and descending to and from heaven, also known as Jacob's ladder. They would pass the place where Joseph was buried after his bones were bought, brought back from Egypt. And remember, this Old Testament Joseph is the one we're talking about, is the one who God used to deliver the Israelites from the famine by putting them in Egypt and putting in rising Joseph to the level of prime minister, so to speak, so that God's people could be saved. And they brought Joseph out of Egypt into his ancestral home. And it was there that Mary and Joseph and preborn Jesus would have walked past where his bones were buried. They also would pass on the way of the patriarchs. Places where prophets like Samuel and Elijah and Elisha would prophesy warnings. Saying, clean up your act. Get your behavior right. Turn away from the chaos and the calamity that is coming if you don't get your life right. Now, of course, the Israelites didn't, and the temple was destroyed, and they were sent off into exile. The way of the patriarchs also traced the way that the Israelites would have come back out of exile, the remnant, those who were still faithful to God. And so with Jesus along for the ride in Mary's womb, Jesus himself is going the way of the patriarchs as the apex of the history of God and his promise to come to his people. But it wasn't just about retracing the past. It was about projecting the future. Because on their way from Nazareth to Bethlehem, they also would have passed the valley of Megiddo. Which is where the battle, the final battle of good and evil would take place. Where God and the angels, Jesus and the angels specifically, would come and finally and ultimately defeat the devil and his demons. The way of the patriarchs was about God coming and claiming this history, past and present, and then pointing to the future. And friends, throughout this season of Advent that we have been using to prepare us for this evening and our celebrations in the morning, we are reminded of the whole promise of Emmanuel. That in the time before Jesus was born, the Israelites were looking forward to the arrival of their Savior, the Messiah. And Jesus came and he lived and he taught and he performed miracles as God with us, as Emmanuel. And of course, he went to the cross to save us from our sins. And he was resurrected never to die again. And leaving us the promise from the ascension that he will return. And therein lies the whole encapsulation of Advent. That God promised to come. He is with us still and he promises to come again. And defeat evil once and for all. This was the way of the patriarchs that Mary and Joseph and Jesus traveled as they moved from Nazareth to Bethlehem. That was 
the road. But the family had a road too. The family had a very distinctive road. I think about Joseph. He's walking on foot. Now Joseph is the one who's trying to be mindful of the places where they might be able to make a pit stop if necessary. Of course, they're not having to refill their 2009 Toyota Camry like I might be. But he had to make sure that there were provisions for the donkey and for Mary. All the while being mindful of the surroundings because the, the trek was treacherous. And it was also treacherous because there were thieves and bandits. Particularly knowing that people were traveling to their ancestral homes with provisions and with money for taxing. They were ripe. As targets. And so Joseph was having to be mindful and courageous and bold to lead his wife and their unborn son. But Mary was also pretty close to popping. I can imagine from experiencing late pregnancy with Tiffany that Mary was probably, shall we say, uncomfortable. And I can imagine that riding on the back of a donkey on non-paved roads over the course of a couple days, 90 miles, jostling and bopping up and down, I imagine she was probably exhausted at best. And I imagine that she was none too pleased to have to make this trip late in her pregnancy. And all the while, you know... Jesus was one who was going to walk on water. And I'm sure he was practicing there in the womb. Right? Because he had to kick and he had to punch. And I'm sure he was turning and rolling around. Mary had to be miserable. I would expect. But yet, on the trip, they knew they had to go. It reminds us of Mary's surrender and her obedience. Her obedience, let it be with me according to your way and your will, your word. Joseph was called upon to be righteous to do the right thing and to be courageous, to be bold, to be strong. While they brought the savior of humanity through the way of the patriarchs. Telling our story from the past. With the victories and the defeats. Moving into what is happening in the present. As they are going to Bethlehem to fulfill prophecy. And to continue their journey. More on that in a couple weeks. But to point it to the future. That the time will come when the one who saves us from our sins. Will also ultimately vanquish the forces of evil and darkness. That are trying to invade the world. And steal those for whom God loves and sends his one and only son. There's an intersection with our road here this evening, past and present and future. I'm sure you can look back at your own past and see those times when you did really, really well. And you felt God's presence and God's pleasure and God's love in your life. I am sure there are also times when you feel defeated. Whether it was a mistake that you made or a decision that someone else made that adversely impacted you. I am sure you have been through a time or a phase in your life where you felt like that road was rocky and treacherous. Full of threats and the unknown. But all of us here as we intersect the hopes and fears of all the years meeting with Christ in this place tonight. We have that hope of what Christmas is and what Christmas promises to be. For God came, God is with us, and God promises to come again. We are to get our life ready and to remember, even if we are suffering through a time of spiritual or personal or physical darkness, that the light still pierces and penetrates the darkness to illuminate our lives, to give us the hope and the peace, the joy and the love that we need. To see that that light still shines even when it is hard for us to see. Our road intersects with God's story to remind us of where we've been, where we are, and hopefully to point us in the direction that he has called and asked us to travel with him. There's no doubt there are all kinds of threats. 
some that we make on our own, others that come to us by the virtue of someone else's decision or things that just happen in our fallen world. But I want you to know that if we follow the example of what Mary did and say, let it be with me according to your way and your will and your word, and we take the courage and the strength and we seek to live a life of righteous integrity like Joseph did, that we can see the movement of God in our own journey, and it will change our lives from here on out. And so I have these takeaways, just real simply, that I want to use tonight to help us bring this point of our service to a close as we get ready to move into the communion and candlelight portion. I want you to stay on God's road with surrender and courage, obedience and integrity. I want you to know that God is always with you, moving through your past with your victories and with your defeats. He is here in your presence, in your present, I should say, as you're trying to make decisions to live with courage and surrender. But he's also in your future calling you forward to say, come, be with me. Let me help you live the life that only you can find when you come to me. My friends, all of this is required because of what Joseph was told the son's purpose was. It was to save us from our sins. Those messes and misses and mistakes that we have to live through. Those times we've gotten it wrong, we choose to go our way to do our own thing as opposed to what God would want us to do. Jesus came to die for your sin. To pay that penalty to fulfill God's wrath and to make it possible for you to know that the heartbeat of heaven beats for you eternally. Jesus doesn't come with condemnation. It comes with an invitation. Come to me. Follow me. Work with me. Walk with me. Rest with me. Allow me to help you to get your life in order. All too often, particularly in the high and holy times like Christmas and Easter that we'll discuss in the spring, we have to think that we've got to be perfect in order to come to Jesus. That's not his message at all. In fact, he says, come to me, all you were weary and worn out and broken down with your messes, your misses, your mistakes. Come to me, and together we will clean up your life and get you going in the right direction. You don't have to clean your life up, clean your plate, clean your room, whatever, before Jesus comes. He is already here, and he wants you to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that his invitation is for you to come and to experience his forgiveness and the salvation that comes as a result. And that is how we find ourselves at the communion table. The communion table that we celebrate actually is part of the Passover meal that Jesus celebrated with his disciples on his last night before his execution. The best way for me to describe the Passover meal was it was something akin to Our Thanksgiving celebration is it tells the story of how God was with them in the past and moving them from the present into the future. And Jesus celebrated this Passover meal with his disciples. Yet what he did that had to have blown their minds if they were paying attention was he changed the meaning of it. For at one point in the meal, Jesus lifted a loaf of bread and he gave thanks to God And then he broke it, and he passed it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, all of you, for this is my body that is given for you. Take and eat and remember. Jesus was shifting the focus from the past to their present and saying he was the bread of life. When that supper was over, the Lord Jesus lifted the cup, and in giving thanks to God, he blessed it and passed it to his disciples, saying, take and drink from this, all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many in the forgiveness of sins. That's a fancy way of saying that God's salvation comes to us, not based on what we do or how we may try to earn it, but it's based on what God has already done for us in Christ Jesus. And so as Jesus passes the cup and he says, take and drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood 
poured out and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, he is saying that he has already accomplished that which he has called us to receive and accept. So, though we may be many, as we come together and we eat from the one loaf and we drink from the one cup, we proclaim the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus until he comes again. Again, this isn't anything that we've done. This is accepting what God has already done for us. And so Jesus transformed the meaning of that meal. Whereas they first started to gather with his disciples, they were focusing on how God rescued and redeemed his people from slavery in Egypt. And what Jesus was doing was for the disciples, saying, I am rescuing and redeeming you from slavery to sin and death. Our salvation is at hand through the forgiveness of sins. Eat the bread, drink the cup, and remember that God is real. He loves us and meets us right where we are, way too much to leave us there. So he calls us and beckons us forward based on who he is, not on who we are or what we've done. Will you pray with me, please? Almighty God, I give you thanks for this holy, holy evening, this most beautiful of services, this Christmas Eve candlelight and communion. Almighty God, we give you thanks for how you gave us this service as a way to remember you, but also to find the nourishment that we need for our own spiritual journeys. There's certainly not enough calories in the, the pinch of bread or the the splash of juice to sustain us. But Lord, what we are doing is we are ingesting you and taking you into our lives and finding the fulfillment of the promise that you said when we eat of your flesh and we drink of your blood, we shall never hunger or thirst again. And so I pray, Almighty God, that we, like Joseph, may hunger and thirst for righteousness and obedience to live lives of integrity and to also be like Mary for the obedience and the surrender to say, let it be with me according to your word. And so, mighty God, as we intersect with us here in this moment, I thank you for the gift of the loaf and the cup. May they be for us the body of Jesus, that we may be the body of Jesus, known as the church, redeemed and restored for service and ministry in the world around us. And I pray that you pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us who are gathered here, and especially on the loaf and the cup. That as we receive it, that we receive you, and in receiving you, we commit or recommit our lives to living for you, to carrying your light of the world out into our community and across all creation with the love and the peace and the hope and the joy of who you are and what you want to accomplish in our lives. So, mighty God, as we come to this very special moment in the midst of this busy season, I pray that we may know that you came for us, you were with us still, and you promised to come again. And so may we find you as, as the intersection of our hopes and fears for all the years that they may be met in you tonight. I ask this in the name of your son and our savior, who Jesus, who we celebrate his birth, but would later teach us to pray the words of the Lord's prayer. And the words are going to be on the screen. Our father who art in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And to forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. Pray with me. Almighty God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery which you've given yourself for us. Grant that as we close this service and go back out into the world that we may do so as light bearers in the midst of our own journey. Lord, we know that there are highs and lows, ins and out, twists and turns, threats from the terrain, threats from people who seek to do us harm, threats that we can't even foresee. Yet we know that you are with us. We thank you for how the journey of Mary and Joseph and Jesus brings us to this place where we ourselves can find our own participation and place in it. Forgive us, Lord, for the times we fall so short, and we do so often. But also, God, thank you for providing for us the opportunity to receive our salvation, not based on anything that we have done, but based on who you are and what you've done for us in the cross of Christ. So may we receive his invitation to come 
and to receive that forgiveness, to receive the light of the world penetrating and puncturing the darkness that we may go back out into the world, lifting high that light of Christ, sharing it wherever we are, from our church to our community throughout all creation. For it's in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen.